Okay, today we are looking at your God connection, the kingdom of God according to Jesus. And these will be some ideas you've heard before and some ideas that maybe you haven't because I just now thought of them. So if you heard of them before, you probably are very intuitive. And that's a good thing. One thing that Jesus said that I think I've included in all of my books, this line, because it meant so much to me and I didn't know where it came from, but I found out and it's pretty interesting. But he said, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. That struck me as uh, that we will all learn directly from the presence of God. And he, what he was saying was, uh, what he was quoting was, he was paraphrasing from Isaiah and from Jeremiah. And the reason I think that he was so familiar with these two prophets, and the, the quotes that I'm going to share with you in particular, he was able to condense them because he thought about them all the time. And I think he based his whole ministry on this idea, this idea that they shall all be taught by God. Because when you look at his many of the sayings that are attributed to him, what, what this statement is, it's a statement of mysticism. And many people do not care for that term because it sounds like mystery, uh, occult, or some, you know, we link it to a lot of things, and it has been done in the past that way. But I think it's a beautiful term, and it says exactly what I want to say. I think he was a Jewish mystic. And it, when, when we understand that, we will see a whole different uh, slant on his ministry, on what many of the things he taught. But going back to Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah said, All your sons shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your sons. So why would he focus on this one verse from Isaiah? The more important one, I think, is this one from Jeremiah, which I've shared with you several times. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this statement by itself is a pure statement of fundamental mysticism, that I will write my law upon their heart, you know, embed it in soul. And later Jesus said the kingdom of God is not something you will observe, you won't see it coming, because it's within. And there are many statements that he made that align perfectly with Jeremiah's prophecy, to the point where I think Jesus patterned his ministry after Jeremiah, that he did not consider himself the fulfillment of Jeremiah, of the, of the prophet Jeremiah, but that he latched on to this particular statement. And the reason I think he did is because other uh, places in the New Testament, Hebrews in particular, the, the letter of Hebrews, focuses big time on this statement, but they reinterpret it in a very different way. That's kind of the topic for another talk. But I think Jesus probably talked about Jeremiah a lot. We don't get that in the Gospels, of course, because we weren't sitting with him, you know, at the campfire and just around talking about. If, if I was a follower of Jesus, I would ask him things like, why are you doing this? You know, what's the point of your ministry? Why, why would you choose this over being a carpenter? Probably a lot more secure of a job. <laughs> there, there is so much we don't know historically about uh, the man Jesus, that uh, he's been filtered through the consciousness of the early church. 
We know what the early church wanted him to be, but we don't know if that's what he was. And so we find these things that are uh, important insights into a deeper level of what he probably taught. You remember the uh, people were going to stone him for claiming he was one with God because they said that's blasphemy. Well, that's what the mystic says. We're all one with God. We're all expressions of God. That's a fundamental part of the teaching. So I keep going back to that idea that Jesus was a mystic, that, uh, but that's been lost in the uh, gospel presentations. But it's still there. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. You've got to find these gems of truth that are scattered throughout this field of the Gospels. And they're there. They're very, uh, once you see them, you can see them every place. But my research for talks and writing often takes me into the territory of mainstream religion. The commentary I read clearly treats God as a super being, a brooding, uh, brooding over the problems we're creating just biding his time before he steps in and straightens out this whole mess. It's very easy to think that's what's going on because all you have to do is look out at the uh, world, you know, read some of the news that's going on and uh, it's always in chaos. It was probably that way the day that every one of us were born but we may not have paid you know, tuned into it like we, like we do as adults. But the people that believe the world is about to end have every generation proof has been given. You see all this stuff going on, it's about to end. It's going to happen. And so it's very easy to think that the end is near by looking at what's going on, but why would Jesus say it doesn't come through observation? It's within you. And the reason he would say something like that is because he was mystic. And that's how he understood the kingdom of God. But you still, when you listen to mainstream uh, preachers talk, you're still getting this powerful old man image that God's up away from us. So the ancient Jew and present Jew taught that we're separate from God, that we will never be one with God. The essence of God and man will never merge. Uh, humankind can come into good standing with God, and that's kind of the hope. That was the idea of the, of the coming kingdom. The belief was that the Messiah would show up and usher in God's kingdom, which would be a, a Jewish utopia that it would be um, where Judaism, the Jews would rule the world, probably the part of the world that they were in at, the, at that time, uh, the uh, Holy Land. But they were looking to the future for something to happen, looking for the Messiah to show up and start changing things. So Jesus shows up, he's got a special gift and many people think he might be the one. And so that kind of catches on with a few people. Not too many Jews accepted that idea, though. It's important to remember that. It's why what became Christianity had to exit Judaism. The time came, would have to come where they split. Because there were not that many Jews that thought Jesus was the one, was the Messiah. They thought other people were, and they were wrong about that as well. But what's interesting here is the, the idea that it's about to happen, or it's going to happen. So what the Jews were waiting for, they'd been waiting for for a thousand years. They were waiting for the reestablishment of an era that was much like that of King David and Solomon who followed one of the richest men in the Bible. They waited for a thousand years. And so you can see why they might be getting a little impatient, maybe jump on the Jesus bandwagon. 
But Christians are outdoing them. We've already outdone them by a thousand years. We've been waiting 2,000 years. So doesn't that kind of raise a red flag that maybe that's not going to happen? Maybe Jesus was right. It's not coming by signs to be observed. You're not going to say it's low here, low there. But that was lost. And what happened is the, the churches that began after Jesus was crucified, 40 or 50, 60 years after that, gospel started appearing. Church was forming, and it's nothing like the church we think of today. It was groups that met in homes, and you know, it was scattered. It was groups like this, scattered all over the place. He still didn't show up. And they were teaching this, that he would show up. So they began to say, okay, we've got to figure out how to take care of our own. We've got to figure out how to take care of this community. And so the disciples come up with this idea. Let's pool our wealth. Everybody in this room, take all your bank accounts, take all your possessions, put them in a pile. And I'm one of the... Uh, disciples so I'm going to take I'm going to manage it for you and we're going to distribute it equally so nobody will lack it was uh, one of the first welfare systems that we know of and it was a very good thing as far as it went but you have to remember these people were expecting Jesus to return any day this welfare system would not was never intended to become something to take care of people for the rest of their lives. Just as long as it took for the master to return. But what has happened, and, and that welfare system was the organization, it was the early church. And the early church developed into one of the things you find in First Peter talking about uh, the leaders of the church deserve double the amount that everybody else is getting. You know, we're going to pile our wealth together, we'll distribute it out, but the ones that are leading, that is the teachers, get double. That's why I want to be one. <laughs> and that's been happening for 2,000 years, and it's more than double. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And it all depends on our waiting for Jesus to return. And it's not getting any smaller. It is a huge industry. All based on Jesus' return. And of course the main hook there is that we've all sinned, so we've got to have him returning, and we've got to have that, that element. But what started as a very simple uh, organization immediately started developing into a hierarchy. Those who were getting double, that is the leaders, you can just imagine, well, that would be an attractive position to be in. So I think I'll learn to be a leader. And I think I will work to get myself into a leadership position so I get double. Well, that's why I quit Unity. That's why I quit our organization because you see that every place. It's like, I don't care so much about what you're teaching. I just want to be in that position where I can have some influence. And it's all over the place. Look at the Vatican. And I'm not going to point fingers at the Vatican, but I'm going to point fingers at the Vatican. That is, that is what that group of disciples started as. And look at the hierarchy. They have a special event. They come out in their robes, and, you know, it's a, it's a very... Uh, I guess a very impressive thing, but to me it is so far removed from what the man from Nazareth was talking about. It's just not even connected to it. But that's one of the problems with organization and what happens if you look at the book of Acts, you go from the teachings of Jesus to the teachings of the church. It's all about the disciples, the disciples, how they interpret who Jesus was. So it's taken over by the organization. Jesus said the kingdom is within you. The church that follows said the 
center of power that you want is us. So you need to be part of this. You need to be part of this organization. So the shift went from God within to I must be within the church. I must be within the organization. That becomes my identity. That becomes my center of power. So it's a major shift. And <clears throat> we stop waiting for the law to be fulfilled of the old Jewish law. And we start looking for Jesus to return. It's the same idea. I'm here. It's out there. And one day we'll, we will unite. One day we'll come together. So the Jews waited for a thousand years. We're waiting for 2,000. Would you bet on it? I don't think Jesus will return in our lifetime. I don't think Jesus will return in anybody's lifetime. If I was Jesus, I wouldn't want to return, frankly. <laughs> the world is very much the same today as it was the, when he was here. And this whole thing that he taught, if you go within yourself, you find your center of power within yourself, your life will get better. That's not too hard to grasp with your head. But if you are a struggling peasant or a slave, you know, a lot of the early people in Christianity were in the Christian movement were slaves. They didn't have a real bright future to look forward to. That's why they wanted Jesus to return so they could step out of their slavery and have a prosperous life. That was the hope. It's a utopia that will come and everybody that's involved will share equally in all the bounty and all the great stuff that's going to occur. So that's why it was attractive. That's why it was attractive to the Jews because we get reestablished in an era like this golden era like uh, during the time of King David and Solomon. I want that. I want to be part of that. And so I will keep myself in good standing so when the Messiah arrives, I'll be on the bandwagon. And we're saying the same thing from a Christian point of view. But if you follow the money, the old saying, look at where all the money is. It's not in mysticism. It's not in the teachings of the inner kingdom. It's not in that direction. It's in those organizations that are saying he's coming. Be prepared. We drove by a couple churches this morning, big churches, and their parking lots are full. And they're hearing the exact message that is opposite of what I'm saying right now. So that's where I'm at with that. The notion of God as an indwelling presence is not as easy to imagine as saying he's coming. You can actually paint pictures of him coming. <laughs> you can paint pictures of God. You can paint pictures that are easily easy to accept into the imagination because you can see it. How do you envision the kingdom of God within you? Next time you have open heart surgery, do you think your surgeon's going to find that kingdom of God in you? How do you find that? How do you explain that? How do you say this could make a big difference in your life if you spend time in meditation and prayer and working toward getting a firsthand experience with this inner presence instead of thinking of it? See, Jesus really wasn't waiting for anything. You say there's four months to the harvest, but I say, lift up your eyes. See the fields already white for harvest. That's a mystic. That's a principle of mysticism. It's not coming in the future. Many of the teachings of Jesus involve the condition of consciousness. This is the key to understanding his teaching, I believe. The reminder that you can't get figs from thistles shows the importance of our state of mind. Even a wavering faith as small as mustard seed is enough to heal a physical condition. And believing you have received what you asked for in prayer ties a successful outcome to a positive and expectant attitude. These examples strongly suggest 
that Jesus considered our God connection intact, in full operation right now, and is always within our reach. See, if he's walking around telling people this, that it's not going to come like your teachers have told you. It's not going to come in the way that you learn from day one in your religious education. And all kids would have gotten that, probably through their families, through a local rabbi or some way, just like we did. I went to Bible school and Sunday school and all the stuff as kids. I have pictures of that. I still remember David holding Goliath's head. You know, that was <laughs> very graphic, but it was there. And <clears throat> somehow that's okay. You know, that's another story, too. But um, this whole thing of something coming is much easier to grasp than something's already here. If it's here, why am I not experiencing it? You know, there's. I was reading an article yesterday, I think it was, about the uh, homeless problem here in Grand Junction and uh, all over the place. And what do you do to resolve it? And it's not an easy, there's not an easy answer to it. But I don't think I could talk to too many people who are standing on street corners asking for money if I went up to them and said, you know, I can help you understand how your thinking connects to your life. They'd say, well, do you have 10 bucks? <laughs> you know, it's like that, a, a teaching will not help most of them. It may help some of them. But if you actually give them, you know, what was it Emerson or whoever said, I'd, it's better to teach a man to fish than to give him a fish kind of thing. That's what Jesus did. He taught people how to fish. He taught people how to tap into that deeper level of understanding. And again, if you are struggling in your life in any kind of a situation, this whole God within thing, may not seem real powerful. There's a real learning curve to it. And he said that the, the, the gate that leads to life is narrow. That the gate that is wide that everybody goes through, that's, that's the let's wait for the future thing to appear and draw welfare in the meantime. It's like looking for uh, ways to solve the problem here but not here and it's the here that's the most difficult the here in the head or the here in the heart but he said where your heart is that's where your treasure is and that's really you know when your heart's in the future it's going to come i think that's probably what every person in church this morning is hearing it's going to come and that's where the treasure is But it hasn't come for 2,000 years, so I'm a little suspicious. <laughs> I just don't think that is what Jesus was talking about at all. But what they did, what the Christian movement did, is they shifted from the old Jewish expectation, and they put a new face on it. But it's the same principle. I'm here. It's out there. Someday we'll connect. And if you do the right things, you'll be part of the party when it arrives, when it happens. So join up. When Jesus warned against judging by appearances, he was telling us not to form our inner experience based on what we see and hear. Our God connection allows us to make different choices. So today when I hear bad news, it looks like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. The Bible prophecies of the end times it doesn't even occur to me. I just say we as a society or we as a world are having some issues at this moment, but we always have. Do you ever remember uh, as a kid getting under your desk as protection from nuclear blast? <laughs> we don't do that much anymore. We still have the threat. But that was a pretty scary thing, you know, hearing that kind of stuff. Like a desk is going to protect you from a nuclear blast? <laughs> I don't think so. But it's a, a thought that's planted in mind. The world is going 
south. And so we need protection of some kind. And, but the fact that it's falling apart says the end is getting near. It feeds that whole belief system, but you can take any generation and you'll hear the same story. One time you're crawling under a desk, next, you know, a few years later, maybe you're digging a fallout shelter in your backyard or whatever, you know, whatever you do. We're trying to protect against some financial collapse. These things can happen. They can happen any time. But is it prophesied in the Bible? No, it's not. The Bible wasn't even talking about this generation. Revelation was talking about Roman persecution of the Jews, period. They're not talking about us. It's not talking about us. But somebody's going to get up this morning and say it is, and they're going to swear, and they're going to be dressed in a $1,000 suit and be ushered up to the church in their limousine and for thousands of people, they're going to say that. And because so many people are there nodding their heads, we believe it. But it's just not true. It's not going to happen. That's not what he was talking about. So judging by appearances, we look out and we have this negative reaction. And a lot of religion is a negative reaction. I'm in it because I've had a negative reaction. I'm afraid. Fear and guilt are two very strong salespeople in our heads. If I think I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to be part of that group that assures I won't. If the world is going to be destroyed and the righteous are saved, I want to be in that group. So I will join that. So it's a pretty interesting thing, but that's judging by appearances. We are looking at what's going on in the world, and we are saying, I've got to respond. I've got to react. So I'll do it in this way. I once knew an older woman. Her name was Mrs. Clooney, and this is not a picture of her, but I didn't want to put a picture of her up, mainly because I don't have one. <clears throat> I once knew an older woman who literally radiated a perpetual air of peace. Someone asked her how she maintained such an even temper. She said that when someone made a controversial statement intended to stir anger or disgust, she would simply say, yes, it does seem that way, doesn't it? <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty brilliant way to sidestep having to react you know, to something somebody was trying to get from her, a reaction. Yes, it does seem that way, doesn't it? You're not agreeing or disagreeing. She probably was a politician in an earlier life, but uh, she <laughs> knew how to answer that question. But she, you could just tell by looking at her that she was doing it. She was practicing that. She was not getting involved through what her eyes and ears were saying. And she also said this response allowed her to honor the person's viewpoint without agreeing or feeling the need to challenge it. She said she also applied this to herself. When her eyes and ears gave her a negative report, she would say to herself, yes, it does seem that way, doesn't it? It was her way of reminding herself that she was not obligated to engage the apparent controversy. And that's a key point right there, obligated. When we see the things going on in the world, we may feel we have an obligation, if we care, we have an obligation to respond a certain way. And that certain way may be negative. But Jesus said, don't judge by appearances. That's a very difficult thing to practice. But the, the way is, the gate is narrow. You know, we've got to remember this. That if I'm reacting negatively to something, then I'm taking the wide gate. I'm entering the wide gate. And what he said about that is it leads to destruction. Destruction of what? I entered it, and I'm still here. It's destruction of my current peace of mind. Destruction of my current inner world. Where I could be having the experience of peace, I'm having an adverse reaction to something. It's quality of life.
The mystic is focused totally on what is going on in you, not on what's going on in the world. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I'd call my angels in to fight for me. My kingdom is something within. It's a deeper level. So your God connection gives you limitless possibilities for dealing with life's challenges. When circumstances tell you it's time to worry, you can say, it does seem that way, doesn't it? <laughs> you can then choose a different response. And see, I think that's why the message of Jesus died with him on the cross. The teachings of Jesus died with him on the cross. Because the world wants somebody to come in and fix the problem. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.